Cancer of the Esophagus. This is one of a series of cancer videos that can be found on the website about cancer.com. Cancer of the esophagus is the 19th most common cancer. Accounts for about 1% of cancers in the United States. The lifetime risk of developing this cancer is only 0.5%. The five-year survival rate is poor, 17.5%. Over the last 30 years, the incidence of this cancer has been increasing slightly. The overall five-year survival in the last 30 years has crept up from 4% to 20%, but is still quite low. The overall survival both in the United States and in Europe, as shown on this graph, has been improving. Again, a lot of progress uh, needs to be made. This is surprisingly a male-dominated cancer, 4 to 1. 81% of the cancers of the esophagus in 2014 were in men. The age of this uh, cancer for men is in the 60s, as noted, 66, and women a bit older, 72 years old. The age incidence uh, gets higher as you get older. Even patients in the 75-year-old or higher age group have a higher uh, age-adjusted incidence of getting this cancer. In the United States, where there's no routine screening for esophagus cancer, most patients present with advanced stages. Nearly 50% are advanced beyond local regional stage. Less than 60% of those with local regional disease are candidates for a curative operation. And 78 to 80% of those patients who have surgery will be found to already have spread to the lymph nodes. If you look at the national data from SEER, which is a large collection of U.S. statistics, only 21% of the patients have local stage disease, and the five-year survival is only 40% as noted. Regional stage, a bit further into the lymph nodes or the area around the esophagus, makes up about a third of the patients, and again, 21% five-year survival. And unfortunately, more than a third of the patients already have metastatic disease, and the odds of living five years are less than 4%. The risk factors for this cancer include cigarette and alcohol use, having a history of Barrett's esophagus, old age being male and African American. The most common forms of this cancer are named after the cells that turn malignant. Squamous cells are the cells that line the upper esophagus. Adenocarcinoma are from cells that line the lower part and are glandular cells, cells that make mucus, and these have become the most common type of cancer. In the 1960s, squamous cancer still accounted for 90% of the cases, but that's decreased dramatically in the last 30 years or so. Tumors at the EG junction, the junction between the esophagus and the stomach, are now quite common. And the rule is within five centimeters of the stomach, uh, into the stomach are still considered EG junction or esophagus cancers. If the tumor is greater than five centimeters from the EG junction or shows no spread into the esophagus, then it's now classified as gastric or stomach cancer. Again, squamous cancer is now less than 30%. This is the cancer related to alcohol and smoking. Adenocarcinoma is now the most common in the United States. This is related to obesity or a high BMI, body mass index. People are very heavy. The risk of adenocarcinoma goes up almost eight times. This is also common in patients with long-standing GERD or reflux or heartburn. And if the patient has Barrett's esophagus, the risk can be 30 to 60 times higher than normal. As this graph shows, the trend for adenocarcinoma in white men has risen dramatically since 1980. At the same time, squamous cancer in white men has been declining. For odd reasons, adenocarcinoma has not risen in black men. Similarly, on this graph, for women, white or black, the increase in adenocarcinoma has been very flat or minimal. And so, in summary, squamous cancer is now less common. It's still more men than women. It's much more common in African-American men and shows up in the middle part of the esophagus and is related to smoking and alcohol. Adenocarcinoma is very heavily male-female. It's much more in white men and it's in the lower or distal part of the esophagus and is often related to Barrett's esophagus. Barrett's esophagus is a condition where columnar cells have extended from the GE junction or in the stomach and moved above the GE junction into the lower esophagus. 
So replacement of normal esophageal lining cells that are called stratified squamous with these metaplastic columnar cells due to chronic GERD or reflux would be called Barrett's esophagus. The median age is 55 years old, so about 10 years prior to developing cancer. And this is the it's associated with adenocarcinoma, not squamous. The estimates of the annual cancer incidence with Barrett's are somewhat controversial, somewhere between 0.1 up to 2% a year. The risk of developing cancer is certainly much higher than normal, but the absolute risk is relatively low. One study said six people per thousand will develop cancer. Another study in people with well-defined Barrett's esophagus, the risk was five people per thousand. If there is high-grade dysplasia, the risk is even higher, 10 people per thousand. And the risk of dying of this cancer in a Barrett's patient was only three people per thousand. There's an argument to be made for screening patients for Barrett's esophagus. This is controversial. The AGA says to consider screening for Barrett's in, in men who are 50 or older, white men, chronic GERD, hiatal hernia, or obesity. In the ACP as well, same uh, argument, men over 50 with five years or greater of GERD may be screened if they have nocturnal reflux, so a lot of heartburn at night, hiatus hernia, obesity, smoking, and abdominal fat. The signs and symptoms of esophagus cancer are listed here. Difficulty or pain with swallowing, pressure or burning in the chest, indigestion or heartburn, unexplained vomiting, frequent choking on food, unexplained weight loss, coughing or hoarseness, or pain behind the breastbone or in the throat. And these type of symptoms should be brought to the attention of a physician. The anatomy of the esophagus, the esophagus is about 23 to 25 centimeters long, or about 9 to 10 inches. It extends from the back of the throat down to the upper stomach. The measurements that are commonly given are measured from the distance of the teeth at the time of endoscopy. The first 15 centimeters are from the teeth to the upper esophagus. There are multiple images and tables and diagrams such as these that show the anatomy of the esophagus, the location of the lymph nodes, the location near the spine and other areas, and the numbers are usually measured from the teeth at the time of endoscopy. There are also definitions of what's considered cervical, thoracic, or abdominal esophagus location, and these are all noted on the tables. There are significant lymph nodes that surround the esophagus, and as the diagram show, multiple lymph nodes in the upper chest and upper abdomen, and particularly in the upper abdomen for patients who have GE junction esophagus cancer. According to the NCCN, or the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, the workup for a patient with esophagus cancer can be quite extensive. I'd emphasize three things that they list, including CAT scans, PET scans, and endoscopic ultrasound. These tests are quite valuable and accurate in staging uh, esophagus cancer. CAT scan is noted over 90% uh, accuracy in looking for local spread or metastases. Endoscopy, particularly with ultrasound, is, is very good at looking at lymph node spread. And PET scans is very helpful to look for metastatic disease elsewhere in the body. For lymph nodes, endoscopic ultrasound, particularly combined with a fine needle aspirin biopsy, is considered very accurate to determine if the cancer has already gotten into the lymph nodes. And this would be a picture of an endoscopic ultrasound demonstrating both benign and malignant lymph nodes. And comparing CT ultrasound and PET, again, lymph nodes are much better found on the endoscopic ultrasound and metastatic disease on the CAT scan or the PET scan. One of the older studies was called a barium swallow or an upper GI. The white barium would look smooth on the x-ray in the normal esophagus and then ragged or narrow where the cancer was. Endoscopy has been around since the 50s and 60s and continues to improve. And these are typical images at the time of endoscopy, what a malignant esophagus cancer would look like in the mid-esophagus or an area of blockage or obstruction. If images are taken, such as a CAT scan or PET scan, they're often shown using what's called cross-sectional anatomy. This is what the esophagus would look like in a patient who was sliced right through the 
area of the chest or the heart. And you can see the esophagus dead center in the middle, cir circled in yellow in this diagram. And these are other typical cross-section anatomy showing the site and location of the typical esophagus. On a CAT scan, the esophagus should be a fairly thin-walled, narrow, slit-like structure, smaller than the windpipe or trachea. And these are typical CAT scans showing a normal appearing esophagus. With a patient with esophageal cancer on a CAT scan, the esophagus usually will look much thicker, almost like a donut as shown in these two CAT scan images. And in a very advanced cancer such as this, it would look like a large structure. PET CT scans are even better. With a PET scan, radioactive glucose is utilized, and since cancers tend to light up or turn yellow on a PET CT scan, the PETs are very helpful at identifying the area of the cancer. These side views pictures show nice images of a CAT scan, a CT PET scan for a esophagus cancer higher in the cervical area, as shown here, in the mid thoracic area, shown here and in the lower thoracic area shown here on a PET-CT scan. Endoscopic ultrasound in the last 10 to 20 years has improved dramatically. The endoscopic ultrasound is very useful at measuring the depth of the cancer into the wall of the esophagus. And there's an ultrasound of transducer at the end of the endoscope that will do an ultrasound image. And these images will show the wall or layers of the esophagus and show how deep the tumor has invaded. The staging system is called the TNM system, based on T for the depth of the tumor into the wall, N for the number of lymph nodes involved, and M for any area of spread elsewhere in the body called metastases. The layers of the esophagus are quite complicated. There are multiple images such as these I'm showing now that show the multiple layers of the esophagus. These slides can be paused to look at the names of the layers. The T system is based on how deep the cancer goes into these layers. The N system is based on the number of lymph nodes involved. And these are typical schematic images showing how deep the tumor can invade in the T stage or the lymph node stage. These can be combined in multiple combinations. Unfortunately, there are over 30 ways to combine these. And for squamous cancer of the esophagus, the new staging system also includes the grade, which is the measure of how mutated the cells are, and the location within the esophagus. This goes into the staging system for squamous. And for adenocarcinoma, the staging system not only includes T, N, and M, and also includes the grade. And these are typical images showing early stage esophagus and more advanced esophagus cancer as the cancer invades deeper into the wall of the esophagus and involves lymph nodes or distant spread. The largest survival data available is from the National Cancer Database. The most current national data is shown here. Unfortunately, only 12% of the patients are stage one. And even within that group, the five-year survival is 47%. Most patients present with more advanced stages as noted here and the corresponding five-year survival. Other national statistics are shown in these graphs and tables. And any of these tables can be paused to look at the actual numbers related to the various stages, both for squamous cancer and for adenocarcinoma. More detailed information about esophagus cancer and other types of cancer and treatment can be found on the website aboutcancer.com.